the inaugural innovator in residence here at the Build Lab. I'm on my second year, second term, and just really grateful um, for the experiences we've been having. And those of you, um, raise your hand if you've ever been to one of one of my events. Okay, so we got some repeats. We got some new people, which I really love to see. Um, so what you're going to experience tonight, my hopes, is is insight, information, and inspiration. Um, so, uh, uh, alliteration. That alliteration that, that you will be able to leverage as you navigate forming businesses, dreaming of businesses, um, but ultimately to prepare you to also to make a positive impact on the world. Um, the more you get to know about me, you know that my heart is really to ensure that we all understand our capacity, in fact, our collective capacity, to make change for the greater good. Um, and so we're going to unpack that tonight, but particularly from the angle of what does it mean to hang in there? What does it mean to build resiliency for as an entrepreneur? What does it mean to not give up? And so many people, that is what they're experiencing. Um, I was telling someone earlier today, when we think about all of the businesses are, that are out there in the world, there are so many more that people thought about, so many more that people dreamed of, that never came to fruition, and oftentimes it's because they gave up. They threw in the towel, because it got too hard, because resources were limited, because insecurity began to cre creep in and make them doubt themselves because they didn't know everything. And so they allowed that to create fear. Then there are the life situations that happen with family and friends that make things difficult. So there are many reasons for why we could give up, but tonight we're gonna to talk about why we shouldn't. Um, and ways in which we can reinforce ourselves and revitalize ourselves so that we hang in there um, at the end of the day. And who else to have in this conversation tonight than none other, my friend, my love, Malia Latu. Let's give her some love once again. Uh, and so as we dive into this conversation, I'm going to first ask you, Malia, to you give the folk the 411 on who you are and what you've been able to do in your own life. Malia is the founder of Mass Votes. Look at me tell, I'm gonna give him just a little bit um, of Mass Votes. We already know that Malia is professoring over at MIT um, at, um, in this, the School of Business um, and also is the founder and CEO of the La Zoo Group um, and the Urban Labs and is helping many of our corporations think about how they strategically roll out DNI initiatives and efforts for real though. We're not just talking about saving face type stuff, um, but in a real dynamic and impactful and measurable way. And so we have a lot that we can learn from you, Malia. And I'm just so honored not only to call you friend, um, but to be able to be in community as a colleague doing this really important work. So thank you for accepting the invitation to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And hello, everybody. It's so nice to be with you all tonight. So. Jonathan covered um, a lot of how I would, you know, identify my work, my journey. Um, but really, if I had to do it in a word, I would say I'm an organizer. Um, I started Mass Vote when I was 19, a sophomore at Emerson College, um, and I that led me on a career of realizing that a huge part of what I do is being of service. I'm also black Puerto Rican Italian, so I don't take disrespect very well, which made social justice a natural um, place for, for me to go into with this idea that I couldn't do something or, you know, um, that we were going to be judged a certain way. Uh, that was just something that didn't, I, I couldn't move forward without doing something about that. And so, um, you know, again, I started Mass Vote um, as an organizer. I've been a bank president overseeing a billion dollar p l and was still an organizer then. Um, the bank that I was at in Boston was the first bank to do character-based lending in the state of Massachusetts. We were the first bank to um, do non-customer PPP loans um, during COVID. And it once again shows wherever you are, you can always be in service of the common good. And if you want to sustain, and you all know this better than I do, as the inheritors um, of this fuckery, um, you know better than I do um, 
that the common good is what is actually going to get us through, right? And so figuring out how to do it wherever you are um, is something that I would encourage. And as someone who identifies myself as an organizer, um, it's what I do wherever I am. That's so powerful. Um, and you talked about doing it wherever you are. And I think so often when we think about doing good, we only align that with being in the nonprofit sector. Quite often, people don't think about for profit entities as doing good. I would love to unpack that um, because too often there is this meshed reality around what a nonprofit is, what a for profit is, and uh, oftentimes the nonprofit gets this rinky dink valuation, uh, and we only see for profits as whole, mighty, and credible. And, uh, and, and I have a problem with that. Yeah, it's unnatural. Um, you know, so what is a 501c3? What is a nonprofit? It is a tax status. And we can never lose sight of that. Nonprofits are not created in this world to do anything but help people who can give money get money back. Right? It is a tax classification. It sits in the IRS. If you've ever applied for a 501c3, you apply to the IRS. Right? So all of a sudden, a tax product. Right, if we want to look at it that way, right? A, a tax lever is now has the responsibility to fix the inequities of the world. Right? But what it actually does is it reinforces economic and other inequities because if I need your charity, right, in order for me to make it, then you always need to be rich and I always need to need charity. Right? And so there is nothing, well, if we were having conversations about a C3, I would get into the things, but for now I'll just say, let's say there's nothing really wrong with the C3, right? But what it's not is social policy, right? What it's not is a structural solution to an economy that was built on stolen land and free labor. Right? And so that's why when we look at the nonprofit field, which by the way, is very recent, right? Martin Luther King did not have a 501c3. Right? So when we look at this structure, to give it the responsibility that we've given it is irresponsible. And if we actually want to make change, then we have to engage the influencers of American culture starting with capitalism. Right? Which the nonprofit sector is completely out of. <laughs> right? They, they can't even participate in it. They can't scale the way businesses scale. So now that means I can't scale justice. Right? So now let's look at businesses. Yes, right? Especially public ones. You have to come up every quarter telling shareholders that everything's great and you're making money and, and that's great, right? That's great. But what we do see when businesses decide that they're going to make change, that they actually can make change quicker than other, you know, other stakeholders, let's call them in society, let's say religion or, you know, the commons, the civic square. Right, and so, exactly. So you look at IBM, back in the 60s, right? IBM decided that they were going to open an integrated factory in Kentucky, in the 60s. Kentucky was like, yeah, you're not. IBM was like, okay, cool. And they called Illinois. And Kentucky was like, well, uh, uh, I mean, we still need you to build the factory, we just probably saw these people all these jobs, whatever. And they're like, yeah, no, we're not gonna, we're building an integrated factory. You decided we're not doing it in Kentucky, right? Like that was your choice. And IBM built the first integrated facility in the state of Kentucky, right? So there is a history, not a large one, but there is a history of businesses leaning in to make change. 
And when they do, it works really well. The last thing I'm gonna say is, for a lot of people, they're like, well, businesses don't get involved in politics and that's not business. And that's bullshit. Every regulation is largely funded by business. But we think it's okay when they're fighting the environment. Right? We think it's okay when they're fighting the FDIC. That's okay for them to be in politics. But what people are asking for now, whether it's employers, investors, potential customers, is they're actually asking for something different. And so I do think we're going to be seeing a business change. But um, yeah, that's my that's my quick and dirty answer for why nonprofits. They're important. But if we make them the answer, we will fail. Yeah, we will. And then to your point, um, we can all be change agents wherever we go. And we have that mandate, in fact the obligation to ensure that whatever lane you choose to journey, that you be thinking about how you can, in the words of Dr. Howard Thurman, uplift those with their backs against the wall. Bring up the elders now. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so, Malia, this conversation ultimately is about the art of not giving up. I know, so, I don't know why I'm sitting here. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's unpack that first with discussing how are you feeling? How are you feeling? You know, I mean, in a time, and it, it's interesting, and maybe some of you are feeling this, right? Like, I'm good. My country isn't, <laughs> right? Like, my society isn't, but I'm good, right? And and that's a, a very privileged place to be, a very blessed place to be, you know? But when I first thought about this, like, not giving up, you know, my, one of the first thoughts is, well, the first way you don't give up is by surrendering, right? And this idea of resilience isn't about constant strength, right? It's not about always being okay, um, but it's about having those moments where you completely surrender. And a few weeks ago, I had one of those moments, and the work that we do is primarily in financial services and real estate, and we work on the we work with the business teams and business sides of the corporation to help them drive DE and I through business now, right? So we believe McKinsey when they say that diverse teams are 34 percent more profitable. Um, and, you know, we believe Deloitte when they say that women-led teams in Silicon Valley have a 21 percent um, higher patent rate than male-led teams, right? We we believe in the power of diversity for profitability, and so that's what we work with companies to do. And sometimes it's hard, because not everyone believes it as much as I do. And I was having one of those entrepreneur moments of like, oh my god, like, we're going to run out of decent white CEOs that like, are going to hire me to do this work. And you know, anxiety was like, I'll join you on this like thought train, sis, right? So like, anxiety jumped in, and it was like, I think you're right, like it may never happen for you again, right? Like. And then, you know, then scarcity mentality is like, and you don't even have that much money, so you're fucked, right? Like, <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, my job is to like convince white people to pay me to tell them about, like, and rather, no, I, I started going down that train and then I was like, oh wait, I just have to surrender this. Because it is true, right? I'm asking my clients to go on a really interesting journey. And I'm betting that there's enough in the world to keep my business afloat. And that might not be true, right? I, I don't actually know. So far, so good, right? But I don't actually know. But rather than sitting down and coming up with another revenue stream, right? Rather than sitting down and coming up with a new thing that we could sell, right? Or a new, you know, something else that we could add on. I got in front of my altar, I lit my sage, and I sat there. And I cried and had a good little messy snotty cry and I closed my eyes and I was just and then all of a sudden my smoke alarm went off because I did too much sage <laughs> um, and so that that was that helped me get out of my moment but you know this idea of not giving up I believe starts there you know it starts in these places where you have to choose that I'm not going to give up, and so therefore I need to surrender. I need to do what the universe, right, is gonna offer me. 
knowing that I have the skill set to get through it. And there's times when, you know, anxiety will be like, no, you don't, right? Like, but you're here. And you're here today. And you were here yesterday. And hopefully you'll be here tomorrow. And finding that inner strength, um, I think, is really a building block and a really powerful tool for knocking it up. Oh my God, that's so powerful. And so I want to unpack how you got this. How did you get to the concept of surrender? What was your journey? Oh. to get to that place because I, I meet so many people and since we're talking to young people um, who are in many ways navigating these things for the first time trying to build systems even for themselves to stay afloat um, how do you get there to the point um, to appreciate to understand what surrender even means and what it'll do for you because I meet so many people who even when we think about meditation they say that don't work Right, and it might not work for you, mm -hmm. right? And and so let me right, let me say that this the things that you'll hear me talk about are what work for me. Um, but you know, like um, like I hear my mother's voice right now. You know, like my mother um, is a walker, and that's her meditation, right? And she walks three to five miles a day, and that's her time, and you can't interrupt her. And you know, well, you're gonna find out. You gotta keep her, keep up with her. She's seventy, but she's quick. Yeah. And, you know, and because she can't sit still, and she's not gonna, and, you know, meditation is actually a very masculine form of, of worship, right? It, it's something that's controlling, right? You, and, and, you know, it's been talked about this way, right? But you sit there and, um, you know, versus dancing, right? And if you think about harems, right? Like, there's this idea of dance as a form of meditation, dance as a form of worship, right? Like, so do whatever, right? Do whatever. Um, explore a lot of different things, you know. Um, I'm always open to do someone's rituals, you know what I mean? Like if someone's like, oh, do you want to come to my church? I'm like, cool, yeah, right? Like, let me see how you all do it, right? Like, and you can always pick things up, right? And you can see what speaks to you. Um, but I am a heart, like I learn lessons hard. And so, you know, I think my first time of surrendering um, I was organizing, we were, um, I was working for Harry Belafonte at the time, um, who, those of you who don't know, was the first man to sell a million records, the first black man to win a Tony, bought Martin Luther King his house, and um, I burnt out, and I like surrendered because I was in the hospital with dehydration, and you know, um, got myself to that point. And now I think what has gotten me here is being much more intentional, right? Like not having my body be like, guess what? You're surrendering, <laughs> right? Like, surrender to the ER now. Um, but really, um, you know, but really getting it before it gets there, right? Um, and so I, I'm in therapy um, every week. I love her, she's amazing. Um, you know, I also do spiritual with ritual with a community that includes meditation, that includes chanting, that includes Qigong. I have this amazing Qigong instructor. Um, and I also spend a lot of time with my friends, right? And like we do vision boards and we love on each other and you know, we support and we support each other, right? And, and I think that gives me the confidence to then be able to surrender. Um, when I first realized though that it's something that I might do without being forced <clears throat> was I was going through a really difficult period in my career um, and I basically got off the phone with my lawyer and was like surrender now and I think that was like one of the first times that like my body said let's do this before right before we, we get there you know so um, the journey is ongoing, right? I mean, like even my Qigong instructor who knows, right, we'll talk about his journey, right? Like Buddha says, right? Like it's not that you don't fall off the path, but you fall off and get right back on, right? Before, um, without much time. Um, and so, but finding the rituals, and again, whatever those rituals are, right? If they're walking, if they're making flower arrangements, if they're, you know, whatever those, whatever those rituals are, finding them and doing them, I think then helps open the door for you to find out, okay, how do I surrender and how do I surrender safely, right? Because I, I also want to say that I think there's a difference 
between surrendering and resignation, right? And there is a difference between the two, and you want to surrender, right? You don't want to resign yourself. So it's this idea of not giving up. Surrender is not synonymous with giving up, um, but making space to sustain yourself. Right. Right, it's a part of the process of not giving up. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it, 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 it allows you to get honest, right? It allows you to take a moment. Um, if you're, if, you know, if you're ever playing in waves or swimming, right, and if a wave takes you under, the only thing you can do is breathe out and you'll float back up. And it's what you learned being a child in Hawaii, you learned that very early on, right? Like, don't freak out, just breathe out and you'll come right back up. And it seems counterintuitive, right? Um, but it's the only thing that's gonna get you back up. And I think that that's right. That's a, a good lesson. In, in, and I think about that sometimes when I'm not, when I'm like, I will strategize my way through this moment. You know, like, I'm like, well, you can just breathe out. <laughs> that's powerful. Make sure y'all take that note. Breathe out. That's really powerful. Because like, the idea of breathing in is your inhale. You're bringing everything in, and so often that's what we're doing. We're taking all of the energy, all of the things, all of the circumstances of life, we're bringing them in so much. We're internalizing them. Um, and I tell people all the time that we're every day moving 100 miles per hour. How many of you feel like you just go, 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 go? And how many of you feel like that you take moments during your day to recenter yourself and actually notice the fact that you are alive and you're breathing. How many of you have done that today? You've recognized that you are alive. Yes, that's what I'm about. And many of us don't. We just go, 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 go. And we get exhausted and burnt out and stressed and anxious. And we don't take a moment and say, wait, I'm alive. And that's something for me to acknowledge, be grateful for, be conscious and aware of, and breathe out all of the things that got me down, all of the things that are weighing heavy on me to be able to do that. So let's just take a moment, everybody, sit up straight. Take a moment. Whatever's on your mind, surrender it. It can wait. And this moment is about taking you serious. It's not about taking me serious. It's about having enough value in your own life, the air in your own lungs, the blood in your own veins, that you make some space and time for yourself. So let's do that right now by taking a deep inhale, inhaling all of those things that we say keep us back, hold us back, are weighing on us, inhale them and then exhale them out. Another deep breath in. Thinking about something that you are grateful for. And exhale out. One more time, whatever it is that's been causing stress for you and anxiety, breathe it in. Reflect quickly on something you're grateful for and exhale out. I hope this moment has created for you the opportunity to be recentered, to remind yourself that I'm alive. I'm here. I have something to be grateful for. And I can let all of the things, let out all of the things that is causing me stress and anxiety and keeping me from being able to be my most full self. Mm. Do that as often as you can. I have moments in the day where I feel like, man, I'm not breathing. I feel tense and bottled up and compressed. And I'd say, just breathe for a second. Right, or listen to music, or, but mark it, mm. right? Mark it, do something to release it. Right, I think that that's you know that that's what we were. Um, that's you know again, 
whatever works for you, right? Like it, it's not about and you may find people that you're like, oh wow, like I you know, I like their style, I like how they think about things, I like how they talk about things. You know, but I mean, there will be times where I'm walking into a client. I mean, this is actually a true story. I'm walking into a bank to do a pitch, and um, I was listening to Tupac hit him up. Not sure if folks are familiar with the song, but there's a lot of swears, and he talks about having sex with Biggie Small's wife, and th there's just a lot of the song. And it's what I listen to sometimes before I walk into these rooms, right? So I could be like, yes. Yes, 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 <laughs> but the East Coast and the click you play. Um, and I accidentally pulled out my headphones and like it went like blaring and it was like Tupac in this boardroom and we all had a good laugh um, and they were kind enough to laugh with me, you know, but you don't, you, you can't, I think what helps you, you know, and you, you talked about resiliency, and I just want to double click on that, because I think part of what helps you not give up is not being on the edge a lot, right? Like, um, part of what helps you not give up is to have the energy to do the work, right? Part of what helps you not give up is to have enough positivity in your energy to manifest yourself downstream. Right, so when we're thinking about not giving up and we're talking about surrendering, and you know, one of the reasons why that's important is because it, it will recharge you, right? But what are the other things that you need, you know? So there, there may be something, right? Like you may have a business idea that's not good. And if that's the case, don't put money into it, <laughs> right? Like maybe let that one go. Not give up on your dream about being an entrepreneur, right? Not give up on that, but maybe give up on the idea that the ice box is gonna make a resurgence, <laughs> right? Like, and, and again, having the space, having the tenderness for yourself to be able to have those conversations, then help, you know? I think resiliency is important, um, and you don't wanna have to use it a lot, right? It's a very, very important strength but it's not one that you want to be in situations to use a lot, right? You really just want to be going downstream for, for you know, most of the time. Yeah. That's really powerful. So what do you say to the person who says, I have nothing positive happening in my life and, and I have no hope. I'm going through a lot. I'm going through a lot. So how do I not give up? Yeah, I mean, and gosh, to honor that, right? To honor, I have no hope. I mean, I think, I mean, if I first think if someone said that to me, we'd have a good cry together, right? And we would just honor that, like, like let's just sit with that, right? Like, let's not judge it. Let's not say that you have to have hope, because you might not have right now, right? Um, but then let's talk about what you do. And the fact that we're talking means you have something, right? You know, the the work that I do a lot um, for my volunteerism is with people with disabilities. And the reason why is because a friends of mine pulled me into this community and we've been having fun ever since. Um, but the other reason why, why it really spoke to me was it's one of the few places that I have privilege, right? As a woman of color, you know, single mom, blah, 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 all the stories. I could all go down the checklist of all the privileges I don't have, factually. But I am temporarily able-bodied, knock on wood, that that lasts long. And they say that I'm mentally sick. So I'll believe them. <laughs> and when I'm working, like we did the first disability fashion show here in New England um, with New Balance, and a few other folks and some local designers in Boston Fashion Week. And when we were organizing that, like, I realized how able list our language is, right? Like you say things like, oh, we're just, you know, let's walk and talk, right? Or, oh, you know, we just have to walk over there. And then you're like, I mean, go, I mean, roll, I mean, it's over there, right? Like, and, and you just feel the, the privilege that you have, 
right? And so I think, you know, if you're down and if you're depressed, like, I'm not, I'm, you know, call people who have much more abilities to help you, you know, whether that's a spiritual person, a therapist, a counselor. Um, but also, you know, if you can get yourself out of, I have no hope. And if you can get yourself to, you know, this feeling of, I may not have hope now, but I can do something for someone else. And then that means that I do have something to offer. That means I am doing good in this world, you know? And it's just really, I think it's really, really important, you know, that that we first honor depression and honor anxiety and, and you know, and honor all of the things that make people want to give up. But also, if they're so willing, right? Um, you know, what do they say, right? Like, anger is better than resignation, right? So let's get angry. And then where do we go from anger, right? Frustration. That, that feels a little better, right? And how do we eventually get to hope? Um, it is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but I, I do think that for people who don't feel like they have anything, um, taking a moment to see what you can do for someone else um, might help you get those answers. It's so important and so nuanced. As I know, I'm sorry, I'm right? a nuance bitch, no, Look, <laughs> nuance is what it's about. You have to live in a nuance, in fact, um, because... Life is great. It is. Very Notice, awesome. at 45, it gets grayer every goddamn day. <laughs> and that's the real. Um, the reality is everything isn't one size fit all, um, one path fits all, um, and we have to be willing to be flexible and expansive and how we navigate this world. Um, so my friends, I'm interested in understanding a little bit more about why, you, why you're here tonight. And I think that would be amazing for this dialogue, um, for us to get some insights as to what your own interests, what your own motivations um, and intents were for showing up tonight are. Um, so we can speak to that um, and reflect on that together. And so Jen, you gonna help us out? Yeah. Um, so Jen got the microphone. And let's pass it around. Tell us, why did you show up tonight? What, what were you looking to get, to understand, to unpack? Um, and don't be shy, don't be nervous um, to, to reflect or to answer and, that question. And when someone says, can we like respond? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can do, you wanna do it one by one? You saying? I, that, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. So we're gonna do it one by one, instead of like going down a row. Let's do that. So anybody right, wanna pick a style? style. Yeah. yeah. Free food is also an acceptable answer that I will break <laughs> So don't be shy. I'm a lecturer at MIT. You know I can break down anything. <laughs> yeah. Why did you come? You came for a reason. Oh, Otherwise, you in the back. Oh, yeah. Front and oh, then back. No, you go first. Sis. You okay, go first. Sure. Hi, I'm Sarah. Thank Hi, Sarah. you so much for being here. I'm already learning so much. I went to the last event. And I learned so much. I went to the office hours with one of the panelists. Um, so I saw the email and I was like, sure, why not? So I think. What year are you? Oh, I'm a sophomore. Not yeah. Western. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So you showed up. Yeah. Um, and I think that 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 interest, that sense of being curious and inquisitive, I just think it's just so important. Um, so shout out to you for being here tonight, Sarah. Yes. Okay. There was a gentleman in the back. Uh, hi, thank you so much for doing this. So I came yes. to learn how not to give up. Um, that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm 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 just, I just, I just came because uh, you know we're now I'm a freshman, so it gets much harder than this. So, and it's already pretty difficult. So you know, giving up is very easy. So understanding how to uh, how to work through those impulses, how to understand. You always get better, you know, you will. That's essentially what you I love that. And so, are you from Boston or are you also new to the city? No, I'm, I'm a freshman. I'm from uh, New York, so. Okay, okay. So, first and foremost, how to not give up when you're new to the city of Boston. And you're lucky you're from New York, so you know about snow. I was from Hawaii, I didn't even know about that. And I was 
real ready to give up on that first snow. I was like, oh, this is wet and cold? This is gonna be bad. Um, but I would say, you know, when I found that I was really blessed to find a community that was based in Boston, and I suggest to all students, like, I mean, yes, it's wonderful, you know, to, to be here, but do volunteerism. Like, go out and meet other folks, you know, like, if you are religious, find a church, find a mosque, find a synagogue, find a UU, right? Like, find, find a community to get you out, because that will also just help you know, it, it'll help the drive, right? And, and not wanting to give up. You know, you'll have other places to hang out, right? Um, and I think it helps. It helps it feel um, a little different. Um, you know, but seeking out communities like this, and I think like everyone here, right? Like, how do you all support one another, right? How do you all make sure, like, if you don't see someone in class, like, do you reach out to them, right? Are you like, oh, hey, like. Jonathan, I haven't seen you, like, all good. Um, you know, what community are you building? You know, and especially being your freshman year, and, you know, it, it's it's new on so many levels. And so give yourself permission to feel overwhelmed, right? Like, talk to your friends about feeling overwhelmed, and, um, you know, find that way to process it. And, you know, I think, and also, like, our culture, it's just such a, you know, like, we're fine, right? Keep calm, carry on, like, um, but overwhelming is a part of it, right? And and the academic structure is set up like that, right? Like, oh, you're gonna be so tired and you're gonna work yourself to death and that, 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 that. But don't worry, you'll get another zero on your salary, right? Like, yay. Um, that's part of the culture too, right? So also just accept that as well, you know? Um, and then blaze your own path, like, when I started Mass Vote, I was a sophomore at Emerson College. And um, Emerson is basically a trade school, right? It's a wonderful communication school, a wonderful theater school. So you need to have an in a internship in your field by your sophomore year. Um, and I didn't want to. Um, and so I decided to start my own nonprofit that by the time I graduated college was a statewide multi-million dollar organization and I was on the cover of the Boston Globe, right? Like, so, thank you. Um, but that was, I did that at Emerson, right? Like, it was Emerson that was supporting me. I got 12 credits a year to start MassVo from Emerson and I got a bunch of professors, like, helping me out and, you know, so really utilize this time now. Like, you're never gonna have more creative time and then the last thing I'm gonna say is like, party, have a good time. Like, relax, <laughs> like trust and believe you will not have time like this again. So also enjoy that, you know? Like, learn how to have fun too, and go hungover. I mean, you, you'll, you'll learn how to do those things not drinking underage though. <laughs> so if you're underage, water will do. That's right. And I will also say of that. <laughs> I was like, and yeah. <laughs> it's like exactly. really important. Um, but I will also tell you that I was reflecting on, I think it's either the rear view mirror or the side mirror of a car typically says that objects um, in the mirror are closer than what they appear. And quite often, that is our lives. Um, that the things that we're hoping for, the things that we're working toward, are a lot closer than we actually realize, than they actually appear. Because when you're in the grind, when you're driving, and you're using the tools and the mechanics around you, um, it can feel like it still hasn't happened. Um, it's still not working the way. I'm still feeling a particular way about this thing um, because it seems like it's so far off. Um, and I think that's what people struggle with too when it comes to maintaining hope um, and optimism around things because every day we're operating quite often off of what we see. What the natural realm is presenting us. And so my encouragement to you today is also to be reminded that is closer than it appears. And oftentimes you're gonna do better than you realize. It's gonna end up um, more positive than you imagined it would. 
Um, and you said this even in your own comment, if you wanted to. That's right. If you wanted to. That's right. And so much about this life is about what we want it to be. So much about it. All right, another one. Another one. Who's got another yeah. comment? Why did you come? What's your motivation? For showing up. To not give up. Ooh, yes. Yes. And I love this code. Yes, it's gorgeous. Oh, wait, I want to see the code. Oh, yes. yes. That's one reason not to give up. <laughs> That's right. Hi, um, I'm a PhD student in chemistry department. I'm like halfway through the program. So, um, since I graduated from undergrad and straight into a PhD program, so I never worked a day in my life and never looked for a job. So um, I know most of the people doing what I do would just go to a pharmaceutical company and become a scientist. Um, but I don't want to just do that. So um, so I want to like come here and listen to some like um, mentor or like people with more um, life experience to see what's the other potential opportunity for me and um, also as an international student I don't necessarily know if I want to stay in America so if there are like other better work environment or like other options so I want to try to like gather more information to find out like after I graduate where I'm going to live and what kind of job I really want to do. Absolutely. Um, first of all, try to keep not working. That's, <laughs> that's a really, that's a really good plan. Um, you know, I had to write a resume to become a bank president because um, I had never written a resume before because I had always created, you know, I created Mass Vote, um, you know, and then I worked for Harry Belafonte and he, you know, saw me and was like, I want you to come and work for me. You know, I worked for a think tank. Um, in, in, in between then, which is where I met him. Um, and I believe that so much of my life that has been so rewarding is because I meandered with purpose, right? Like I knew that I wanted to help people. I knew that I liked organizing. You know, I liked getting into a community and helping that community find its power, right? Like I, I liked that. And then I was sort of like, okay, but the how I do it, right? Whether it's a campaign or, you know, it's a nonprofit or it's a for-profit or it's, you know, a C-suite, um, that that would come, right? And so, um, you know, if you don't want to, you know, just jump into a lab or, you know, where, wherever, um, I would suggest that looking at where, what are the other conversations, right? So like thinking off the top of my head, like, you know, I'm sure that there's conversations around accessibility, right, in, in chemistry. I'm sure there's questions around how chemistry is done, right, and, and, and some of the lenses there that may have, you know, a bias or an environmental thing or, right, or, or something that can help you use your knowledge and, you know, your passion for chemistry but not necessarily sitting in, you know, I, I, do chemists sit in a lab? I'm assuming, do you guys sit in labs? Yes, that's one reason why I feel like being a research scientist might not really be the best option for me because I love to travel. And I know being a consultant is another option for career, but like I don't have any business background. Oh yeah, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and it doesn't, I mean, I, you know, I, I I know like we're in college and you know I'm at MIT right so like yes there's sure there's ladders but there's really not right because at the end of the day if you know someone you're good right and we see that all the time with nepotism right like um, so <laughs> so, um, so yeah so I would you know look into who are you know chemists who are doing consultancy and then what are they doing it in? and then can you like work for them for a little bit right and can you learn it that way right um you know you don't have to go and get your mba right most creators of businesses hire mbas they don't have one right um and it's in it's you know so this idea that you're going to need certain qualifications now if you want to become a surgeon yes please get those qualifications um, but 
for things that you know require you know I mean at, at the end of the day business is a philosophy I mean it, you know they hate to say it like that but it is right Adam Smith was a philosopher right um, and so you can learn these things right and, and you can get good at it now as far as leaving this country um, it's something that I think about right I mean this is a kind of crazy time to be here um, and it's not I mean, it's gonna get better once, like once millennials, like once the younger folks have more power and control, um, I think it'll start to get better. But I think it's gonna be a hell of a fight to get there, um, you know. And so when you think about emerging markets, emerging economy, I mean, like what's going on on the continent of Africa right now is completely fascinating, right? And you have countries that are young that are building economies, right, that are building industries, that are building sciences, that might be an interesting place, right, or, you know, to look around, um, and, you know, in, in Europe and Asia. Now, as far as, like, work culture, um, you know, I don't know the studies enough, right, but what I do know um, is that Europe, as far as, you know, as far as, like, rights, right, and, like, getting time off and things are much better than the U.S., right? But Latin America right now, right? I mean, Lula getting into Brazil, like there's things happening around the world that are going to shape the 21st century, right? America, Europe, their, the 20th century, right? Their colonization, their, you know, colonialism, right? They're the enlightenment experiment if we all go back to like our high school history classes in the US, right? Like um, that's not necessarily the future. And so I think if you love to travel, um, yeah, you know, like find f find a place and go, and if you don't like it, go somewhere else, right? Like you you don't have to feel that you're you're weighted down, right? Don't buy a house and you'll always be able to leave. <laughs> and doing exactly what you're doing right now is like really critical, like to get out and meet people and, and build the connections, and certainly while you're still in the program, uh, because as Malia said, you won't have that same dynamic of, of luxury to have access uh, to one a university in this way with so many resources and people and connections and opportunities to really explore and unpack what you're interested in and how you I mean, maybe you're like more. the Neil deGrasse Tyson of chemistry well, no. right I mean you can start a podcast here right like you well, we I are mean, gonna start a podcast room soon so Okay. I look forward to hearing oh, your first yes. podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so much is possible. And so we hope that you will continue to take advantage of all of the resources that you can um, to figure out where you go. But hold on to that that intentionality of wanting to be free um, mm -hmm. and, and figure out how you make it work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, because so many people give up on it um, so soon. Um, and if you have the privilege and the luxury to do that for sure, um, um, that's a blessing. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Okay, my reason for coming to the program. Hard to go giving up. Okay, um, I think I need any motivation on how, how to stay ambitious. So back at home, I arrived in Boston in August yeah, 20th. And I was usually a very ambitious thing. Very ambitious, always looking for the next thing to do. Always looking at what next business, even if one fails, like back in undergrad, I think I moved from like one business to the other and I could care less if it failed or not. <laughs> so here it's like, I came here and it's like, okay, I was like an A class student back in undergrad. So I came here and I'm like, like my ideas are not working here. It's looking like it's a different ball game entirely. It's looking like I'm sitting back in class and just not performing. I do my best, but the results are not just there yet. And I'm like, okay, back in Nigeria, it's like 70 to 100 is like an 80. <laughs> so here it's like I get an 80 something and I could, ne I could necessarily not get an 80. So I'm like, okay. Let's take it one step at a time, right? 
Then I realized that I'm doing a master's program. I realized that in the next one year, that's like this time next year, I will be out of school. So I have to like look for a job or an internship for like summer internship. And this week alone, I think I've gotten up to 10 rejections. And I'm like, okay, should I keep going to school? <laughs> should I wake up and like today I have like two classes that was supposed to hold and I just attended one and I'm like, I'm for the next one. <laughs> Because it's looking like I put in the effort and it's not coming out to be what I want it to be. So, yeah, I came here to like to put for the motivation to like have keeping ambitious basically. And, um, and I realized that over time, it's like I've let go of my passion to want to do business. Now, I'm thinking to the safe route and saying, no, let me just get a job. Because I do not understand the terrain of the business terrain here. So, at least if you want to break the rules, you must first know the rules. So, let me get to know the environment of how a business works first. Then, before I venture into maybe I want to start my business or something, or if I want to just be the best employee in, a, in any organization that does the best thing. So, it's like, did I lower the level? Like, did I lower the bar from where I'm coming from? Am I sure I'm still me? <laughs> exactly. So I think I came there it's like, okay, you have to be giving up, I think. Mm. Yeah, it's just timely. So yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much for that. I know that I saw heads nodding as you were talking, you know, and um, we all we all have been there, right? Where you try and you're like where you know, you come here and you're like, Oh, we're all smart here, right? <laughs> like we're all um, you know, it's it's um, it, it's we see the same thing at MIT, right? Where students are like, "Oh no, like I'm brilliant," you know, and you are, right? And and the work and the learning and you putting in your effort is a hundred percent, whether that's reflected in the grade or not. And I think as far as grades, um, you can decide how you feel about that. I was never big into Right? Um, I think that there, I mean, you don't want to fail out, you don't want to get D's or C, right? Like you, you want to be in a, in a realm, but the idea of getting straight A's or being on a roll or, you know, anything like that is a construct that once, that, that you may want to take off once you can, right? Because learning happens regardless of grades. Um, and that's why you're here, right? So like when I was talking about mass vote before, you know, I was getting 12 credits to do that. That was a pass fail, right? Like no one was grading me on that. But yet I learned more from that practicum than half of the political speech writing classes I took, right? Um, you know, same thing, right? You're getting your master's, right? Like what do you need to learn? And like what I would say is, you need to learn who you need to know. You need to know the networks that BU has and you need to get them to introduce you to the networks you need to know. If you want to run a business, it's great to work for that business before, right? To learn the business model on someone else's dime. So I don't see that as necessarily choosing something less or you know taking a step backwards. Like it's a strict it's what actually a lot of investors look for, right? Like if you're raising and you've never worked in the industry, they're probably not going to be interested, right? So you want to run a franchise, work at a McDonald's, right? Like that that, that makes strategic sense. Um, but the biggest thing I want to tell you, and you know, should you stay in school, should you like those are those are life changing questions for you, right? I, I don't have an opinion on that, one way or another. But what I do want to recognize is how you're judging yourself right now. And you know, sometimes, and I know this for myself, I mean, I was just talking about a therapy yesterday. I am meaner to myself than most people have who I consider being mean to me, all right? Like, um, if I was a friend of mine, I wouldn't be friends with me anymore. <laughs> Right, because I judge myself 
and you know, I'll be like, yep, you fuck that up. Like, oh, that's stupid, right? Like, and all, like, and now, like, in therapy, I'm finally like, that, that's actually me. Like, I'm like, I don't mean it. I'm like, well, you, you, you did call yourself that, though. So, like, say sorry. Right, say sorry, exactly, say sorry. You know, and, you know, you're not getting the grades. Okay, you're gonna get, you know, if you want to try and get more, you can talk to the professor, you know, you can see what you can do. Um, but are you getting what you need from this experience, right? And I, it, there's just no need to judge, and it's so easy to do. You know, it's so easy to see these grades as a judgment of you, or see your, you know, you're feeling a little like less motivated because the, you know, the you, you're not seeing the same response, right? Like it's like when you get to that plateau and working out. Right? Like it's easy to work out when you oh yeah, look at that, right? And then all of a sudden you're like those damn five pounds. Right? And now you're like, oh let me just go sit in the sauna. All right, like you're not that motivated anymore. Yes, I'm telling it myself. Um and then see where you go from there, right? So like what what I'm hearing, how you're framing it right now, I think I would just ask you to frame it in a way that loves you, that centers your strengths that centers your dreams, and that centers your ability, because you are here, yes. right? I mean, you are in an elite school in you know a country that thinks it's one of the best, right? And that means a whole hell of a lot. That means a lot, a lot, a lot. And you're learning about culture. I mean, all the things you're learning, give yourself credit for those things, because those are real things too, you know? and. Once you sort of change that narrative a little bit to be a little more kinder and a little more tender to yourself, then see how you feel, right? And then see, because again, I, like, I don't believe people should go to school if they're not getting anything from it, right? I mean, it's just, it's like, again, right? Most of the tech giants that are, you know, laying people off right now, right? Like, they don't have MBAs, right? They dropped out of college. <laughs> Right, so this idea that you need to do it for the paper, it's just a capitalist narrative that gets you to pay a lot of money to go to college. Um, you know, but if you are getting something out of it, then love yourself into staying and also ask other folks, right? At, find the community. Um, and I'm sure Jonathan and you know, others here, Jen, can help you figure out like where that community can be. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna say like, as as someone who's just getting to know you, like you got it, girl, and you're doing fucking fabulous, and yes. you know you're gonna figure out the grades. Yes. Yes. Okay. Remind me what program you're in. Engineering. Okay. Say that again for everybody. Okay. Biomedical engineering. I don't even know what that is. Right. I'm yeah. like, what? I mean, honestly, sis. Like, you know, get. I mean, it's it. it this is. Probably more of their rocket science, right? <laughs> like, or, yeah. So, so give yourself some time to, to. And let us tell you, we're proud of you. We're proud Absolutely. of you. Absolutely. Um, when we think about um, the careers, the industries, representation, particular people of color um, in all of the industries, for the most part, um, is is really important that you reflect on who are your teachers. Um, and who are they accustomed to teaching? Um, all of the things really are critical to reflect on that dynamic um, and assess it against your own valuation. Ooh, can I tell a story? Ooh, can I tell a story? I knew I was going to, I really wanted to tell this story. I was telling you. So I think I can fit it into here, so I'm going to fit it in. So I'm writing a book. Um, and it's peer review coming out at MIT Press called From Intention to Impact, a Practical Guide to DEI. And, you know, sister who's doing your PhD, you know, right? Peer review. You have to be open for peer review, right? Like the point is, is that they're gonna, you know, punch holes in it and you have to say like, yes, I'm so, thank you so much for bringing up that point and I'm waiting, you have to do that whole thing. And so I turn in my manuscript, or I turn in the book proposal. This was just to like get the okay to do the book. I turn in the book proposal and it goes into peer review, right? MIT Press, right? Like. Oh my gosh, I am not an academic. And I get the peer review back and it is awful. I mean, like I had to call my mom. 
and then I had to take a nap. Like it wasn't that bad. Surrender. Yeah, I had to surrender. I had to absolutely <laughs> surrender. I had to be like, I can't read. I am smart. Like I had to go back to that. And as I was reading these peer reviews, I was like, this is an older white man, older white man, younger white woman. And I could tell by the way I was reading the review, right, by, by what the reviews were saying. And the reviews were also telling me that like the theories that I was bringing up weren't theories, right? I was bringing up critical race theory. I actually brought in the white gaze by Toni Morrison. And they were like, you know, she's not an academic. She did teach. She was a prolific writer, right? So like to say that I can't use her as theory in an academic press was ridiculous, right? It was biased. It was racist. But now, how do you say that when you're in the middle of a peer review? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, and I didn't want to sound like sour grapes, right? And be like, but what I did notice was a majority of the theory they wanted me to read was written by white men. Right? Like, what I did notice was the woman had a much more positive review of my book than these two men who obviously felt challenged, right, by their responses. Right? And. So I was at this dilemma, right? Like what, like, what do I do? And a part of me was like, I guess you don't write a book with MIT Press, right? Like you're, you know, find a commercial press, but you're not an academic, pub, you know, you're not an academic writer. And then I talked to a friend of mine who's a tenured professor at, in the SUNY schools, and he was like, no, 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 no. Let, let, let's figure this out. He's also a black guy, right? So he had his own experience navigating academics. And we went through these peer reviews, and he was like, we're going to take out what makes sense for you to take, right? So if they're saying they want to see more theory, then put in more theory. But you don't have to put in their theory, right? Um, you know, if they're saying that they don't think that, you know, um, these practical applications have a, you know, have a place in academia, let's pull the books that show that practical application, right? Like. Um, but then, once you respond, talk to the publisher. And so that's what I did, right? So I went back to the publisher and I was like, listen, this is the theory I'm adding, right? Like, and it's more, right? It's theories on curiosity, it's theories on empathy, right? It's none of the theories that they asked me, you know, the epistemology of political, you know, work culture in the cubicle. You know, I mean, it was just like, I'm like, oh, these are your students' PhDs. That you'd like me to read so someone reads them. Like, but I am going to, so I'll respond to that, but I'm gonna respond in a way that, you know, keeps the integrity of my work. But then, after I went through that with the publisher, I said, can I just ask, for this peer review, how many women of color were a part of it? Silent. I said, men of color, silent. And then I made a joke, I said, gays? <laughs> and I was like, it was there something? Like, did someone have something? And I said, I know the one woman. And like, you know, because it's supposed to be a private, right? And she was like, well, I can't confirm her. And I said, no, I know she, I can tell she's a woman. And I was like, but I'm assuming white woman, right? Well, you know, we can't say, but yes. Right, and I was like, so can I just ask that as I go through this peer review process, that I at least have one person of color? You know, this is a book on DE and I. I am using theory of color. I am using women's theory, and I would like to have, you know, I, if there's if the white woman's going to represent me, that's fine. My mom is white. I'm cool with that. But I would like to have a person of color, so it can, you know, I can have my peers, and they agreed. Um, and so I was able to you know, move forward with the manuscript in a way that responded to this peer review that was all white. But I was also able to set myself up, right? So when I had to do the final peer review with the final manuscripts, that I actually got helpful feedback, right? I actually got feedback that, and critique that was easier for me to take, right? Because it was relevant to what I was censoring and not what these white men wanted me to censor, right? So I don't know how that ties into your life, but I wanted to tell you all that story because I think that's a great model. And I think, again, getting to what you were saying about, like, do I, you know, like, do I, do I want to keep doing this? You know, like, it, 
find the way for you to keep doing it. You know, um, and and you're gonna be amazing, and you're gonna invent something that'll cure us all, and we're very thankful. In advance. All right, in advance, I would like to invest in your company. We have a chemist for you. You guys can work together and <laughs> fix the world, and we're very appreciative. <laughs> That's so powerful, and really what makes me really that's so powerful <laughs> and it really makes me reflect on this charge that I have for you um, and it is that if you leave be you and you don't know nobody you don't have any relationships you haven't built a network that's when you failed it's not just the grades it's the networks and connections that you have that's access to no, hardly ever will that ever be a conversation um, and, and so, as much as you are focused on the grades, also judge yourself according to it. And am I building a network? Because it's your yeah, network that you're going to have to lean on. That's going to be the key at the end of the day. Um, and so, hone in there. Build those relationships. Because um, I think in building those relationships, you will also find solidarity in other people who will be able to reflect on their own experience and say, I, I experienced that too. Well, I know somebody who went through that too. And that itself will be affirming yeah. and encouraging and a sense of motivation as well. But even practically speaking, uh, the commodity is the connections. That's, that, that's the commodity. That's any other reflections? Any other questions? Thoughts, comments. Thoughts. Oh, yeah, we got it. Awesome. Right? I told the same thing too. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I can hear because the whole COVID thing, um, I feel like there's so little connection. And this is a very vulnerable kind of conversation to have. So I felt like coming here would mean people that are kind of feeling that lack of vulnerability and connection, those people would come here. Um, also, like, going back to you, um, I, like, my undergrad, really different from my grad, and, like, I work, like, crazy jobs, um, so I'm telling you, like, whatever you want to do one day doesn't mean you're going to want to do that the next day, and that's okay. Um, it actually makes you, like, better. That's right stronger and like people don't think about it but like different jobs give you different skills that you're gonna be able to like really like hone into um, when you are doing what you really want to do that's right so yeah like it's chill I'm telling you, like, it's I was gonna say, and it, right I mean the, you you have a sister in struggle right here who understands see um, yeah, no, and to be honest, like, I love the fact that you brought up um, spirituality and, you know, like, uniqueness and like, who we are. Because um, that's so important. Like, everyone just wants to be the same today. Like, a copy and a paste of the same thing. Follow this path, make money, and, like, that's it. And it's just kind of so sad. Like, it's just sad. So, um,. So yeah, that's, and that's sustainable, problem. you know. Um, and I think it's you know, like if I can just say what I have hope for, right? Like when I entered the workforce, right? And I'm not that old. I mean, I told you guys how old I am, right? I'm not that old. <laughs> but when I entered the workforce, like me tooing was a commonplace, right? Like I mean, not only was it common, but it could help, right? Like, you know, um, and it, this idea that there could only be one woman in a place, right? So women were cat fighting one another, you know, like wearing shoulder pads, right? To just look like men and, you know, with this whole thing and, you know, and these, the younger generations after Gen X just give me so much hope because there's, like, I, I almost think, like, to your point, like, 
yes, like folks just want to be a copy and paste. They want, you know, they want to like all. Look, I mean, we now have filters, so all of our faces look the same, right? Like, oh, we have the same Botox doctor. <laughs> like, obviously, right? It's really crazy, but what the fluidity and like the the dedication to justice that like I see when I'm participating is something that just it gives me a lot of hope because I know for me, like I'm really scared about what I'm gonna be getting old into, <laughs> right? Like, um, you know, when you're, you know, when some of you guys are my age, I'm gonna be hopefully retiring, right? Like, and I'm looking at y'all like, yes, like let's talk spirituality, right? Like let's talk about what you need right now because you guys have a hell of a world to fight and the last thing we need is y'all cutting the pace of yourselves, mm. right? Like what we, right, because we have made progress, right? We have women in the workplace now that don't have to kowtow to their male bosses, right? Like we have women bosses now, some of them who can be bitches, and we gotta work on that as well, right? But we have the progress, and you all have, you don't have the same baggage you know, like, um, you know to question it, right? Like, we didn't know to question it, you know? So thank you so much for that comment because I really think that, you know, you guys figuring out how to find one another, you know, and become that tipping point, because there's always the the majority, right? Like, there's, there's always gonna be those folks. Um, but the real change makers and the folks who are gonna lead are the folks who don't want to cut and paste, right? And who are able to really go inside and, and get those tools. And, you know, it sounds like we need to do more not giving up circles. Yes, yes. And find... Oh, like, sorry, so oh, wait, are we done? Oh, and right. find that commonality of that community that we share and that we have, um, which is just so key and so important. And I, I'm really full because I appreciate um, the dialogue that we're having and the, the energy that we're sharing tonight. Um, and before we wrap up, um, really, uh, there's a question I'm asking you, Malia, and that is, what are you looking forward to? Um, so I want you to reflect on that um, for a second. Um, and, uh, and I want all of you to uh, continue to think about what you have to look forward to. Someone asked me, I turned 32 last week, Happy birthday! What did you do for your birthday? We went out. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I literally did ask that question so we could say <laughs> that. Like this. And and um, next month we're gonna we're gonna go meet Malia in Hawaii at, at her, her family's house over there in Kona. So we're gonna have right, a good so that's time. What you're looking forward to. Looking forward to that. And my husband is here, y'all, Derek, um, as well tonight. Y'all give him a round of applause. Show us and so I'm looking forward to that and a host of other things. So I encourage you to be thinking about what are you looking forward to? Because I feel like in my life, that's one of the things that keeps me going. Um, and so when someone asked me that last week when I, um, on my birthday, how do you celebrate your birthday? They ask, so do you reflect on what you've done and celebrate that? Or do you think about what's to come and celebrate that? And I am one of those forward-looking type of people who I'm always thinking about, okay, well, but what's next? Um, and so I encourage you to think about what's next, what's ahead, um, and not get too trapped into what has happened, what's occurred, the past, um, and to hold even um, some grounding in your now, right? What am I now? Um, because quite often, many of us are stuck in the past. We're, we're still harboring and dealing with things that have occurred, occurred in the past, and that's real. Lion King. Yes, that's my favorite movie, y'all. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> but remember that. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. As Mufasa said in Lion King, remember. <laughs> Malia, what are you looking forward to? Oh my gosh. Well, first, I'm looking forward to going to Hawaii. So, one of the things that I'm doing around like loving myself, all the things we talk about not giving up, is during COVID, I started to leave Boston for the winter. 
So I land on Thanksgiving Day, which is a very cheap day. If you fly on the holidays, it's always the cheapest days to fly. Um, and I'm going to be there until March. And so I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, and business-wise, we're actually going to be launching a couple of products next year. Um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes. Um, and, you know, as long as I don't have conversations with my anxiety, it should go fine. Um, but I just want to thank you guys. You know, this conversation can be vulnerable, right? It can make you feel certain ways. And Jonathan, I knew that us coming together, we were going to make sure, right, that we could really get into the feeling. And I thank you all for coming on that journey with us um, and for being willing to swim in these waters um, with us because God knows we like to swim in them. So I really appreciate your time with us. Yes, we love and appreciate you so much, Malia. And my friends, don't let nobody tell you what you can't do. Don't let nobody tell you what you can't do. Not even yourself. That's right. Not even yourself. That's right. Because we are our worst critic half the time. Um, and we do say a lot of bad things and mean the negative things to ourselves. And a lot of times that stuff has to do with what some other people done told us or some or what we've witnessed or experienced in life. Um, and, and, and it's important that we don't internalize that to our detriment. And so my hopes for you, and it, it is a lot. And, and my hopes for you is that, as they do say in The Lion King, um, is that the past can't hurt. But you can either run from it or learn from it. And so I encourage you to learn from everything you experience and allow it to push you forward so that you stand boldly in what you've been put on this earth to do. Um, much love to you. Don't give up. Hang in there. And for sure, lean on your community. If you don't have one, be intentional about building community. Um, and lean on the Build Lab. We are yeah. here. Uh, we are absolutely here. Uh, and so definitely drop through, reach out. We can connect you to people, to resources that can be valuable and supportive for you. Um, you're not in this by yourself. You're not alone. Um, and I'm wishing you nothing but the best as you close out the semester with these final exams and everything else that comes along with it. As you start looking for internships and job opportunities, as you prepare for graduation, as you go back to family for some people. Um, Going back to family isn't always a positive experience. I hope it is one for you. Um, but if that's not the case, um, extending as much love and positivity to you tonight uh, that you keep going when the goal gets tough. All right, my friends? Thank, Thank you. Thank y'all for being here tonight. Thank you again, Malia. Thank you, babe.